Okay, welcome to Thursday, May 27, our class session, Math 264 at Delta College. And we've almost completed one week cycle, one week among our six weeks. So after today, you'll see a full week in the can, so to speak. Now, I'll make some comments right here about the first week. Just as things go, getting a couple more people in the room. Just a few comments about the first week. It's not as smooth as I'd like it to be. Uh, I feel I'm about an hour below where I should be and we'll, that's the first thing we'll correct now. Uh, I, in two problems I've given you this week. Now, I've got solutions to problems posted that you've handed in already. Uh, maybe not the one six problem. I don't think I uploaded that yet. But the solutions, the problems from one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, the ones that you handed in already, those solutions are posted and you're welcome to read those. Um, finishing reading your problems, then I'll return them to you. I like said a second ago, I feel like I'm about an hour short of where I should be. And that's the nature of what we're doing. We are pressing to get a lot of sections in at the very beginning. So we will compensate if we had to. On two of the homework problems that I gave you, uh, there's a notable underestimated how difficult the problem was in one, two and one, three. I didn't think that this was gonna come out as difficult as it did. Now, certainly this problem is separable. You can separate, integrate, no problem. But the things that made this problem a little more challenging than I anticipated was you had to do some algebraic work to solve for y. Okay. But the other thing that uh, I didn't quite anticipate is that in the solution, the presence of an e to the t squared made graphics a little bit challenging for a computer or such. So look at the graphics I produced in that problem. See how I drew solutions on slope fields. And I believe I posted a Mathematica notebook showing how I constructed the solutions in the slope fields. Let me double check that. Uh, yes. And I'll show that to you in a second. But if you are working on learning how to use Mathematica Bruce pictures, you could look at the notebook I used to produce these pictures. So that problem from 1.2 and 1.3, I used the same problem to do two different things. It was more challenging than I expected. The problem I posted for 1515 alt was uh, actually incorrect, undoable. So let's just check if anybody noticed that. Now I have posted a solution for 1515, you know, saying, whoops, you can't do this problem because the initial condition that was printed on the page doesn't match the differential equation. But I also wrote out a solution for that problem with a problem, a correct problem that I intended. So if that happens, that error is on me. So I have to assign full points to everyone for that problem. And I do that regardless of your work because it was my error. But I also want you to understand that if you examine that problem carefully, you can see that there's a physical error in the problem that makes it impossible for you to proceed. And if you did produce an answer for that problem that was physically impossible, then remember part of that problem says check to show that your answer works. So your check should also reveal to you a problem because you can't have a working answer to a problem that's illegitimate. And that specifically dealt with the existence and uniqueness theorem, but you can review that 
and see what happens. So uh, I consider that when I grade, if I make an error in the presentation of a problem, then that's completely my responsibility. And I'll assign you the points, but make sure that you are examining critically anything that someone hands to you to make sure that they're handing you a legitimate work that you can do. Okay, so those are the two things that stood out to me so far in this week. And the reason why I want you to see a full week cycle is that today our goal is to only practice problems and answer questions. Now, I'm gonna say something for maybe the first hour about the method of integrating factor and the method of undetermined coefficients because you need it to do problems. And that's why I said I'm about an hour short there. But as I scan the first chapter, and you can bring any questions you want to in the chat, anything you're working on, I just made a list for myself. Oh, what's uh, some of the highlights in each section? What are some of the cool problems that you have to make sure you can do? So problems I would have asked about if I was trying to do this or learn this. So there, it's absolutely impossible, even if I used a full two hours to go through all these problems with you. But as I've underlined here, the solutions to these problems that I've underlined in blue are posted. So they're sometimes among the recommended problems. So let's think about, this is like a triple whammy. If it's in the recommended problems and I've posted a solution and I've made a note of it here in this list, those problems must be like triple gold you're trying to anticipate the things that show up on an exam? Well, a good way to anticipate things that show up on an exam would be what? Homework problems you've done, recommended problems I said that I liked, as opposed to other problems that I didn't recommend, and then particularly recommended problems that I thought were important enough for me to post an answer to. So even if we only get through a couple of these, this is a good list for you to be checking yourself on. Third comment I wanted to make that I noticed this week, and this is neither here nor there, and it's not in any way a criticism because I know you guys are working very hard and this isn't the only project on your desk, but there are a lot of questions that you've asked that are completely worked out step-by-step step among the recommended problems I posted and among the short videos I posted. So I don't mind pointing you to the video or the recommended problem. I, I don't want you to hesitate at all to ask a question, whether or not it's in those lists, but I will point you to those recommended problems and videos when you ask some questions, just to make sure you get in the habit of working those resources to do what you need to do, okay? If you want to add anything to this list while we're working today, throw it in the chat box and I'll write it down here in red. I will prefer your questions to mine. In other words, if you suggest a question, I'll do it before I do any of these, you know, as they come along. So I'll give priority to your questions. Uh, the other thing, and make sure you're taking advantage of this resource. Remember on the homework, again, I know you have very limited time available, but uh, I don't have any problem if you're comparing and working together, working out problems on the homework, not the exams. We'll talk about the exam next week. So don't hesitate to post a note to the Google group, just as you don't hesitate to post a note to me if you just want to compare something with someone else, or if you want to ask someone how they approach something. Uh, along with that, when you send me a note saying, I'm not sure how to do problem X, Y, and section Z, there's no harm in attaching 
the work you've done? Because the first question I'm likely to ask you is, what have you tried to do? What have you done? Because then I can direct my answer to you very, very quickly and sharply, rather than just going off on some general speech like, well, this is how you do these problems. When you bring a question, bring the work you've done so I can get right to your need, okay? So this is how we're gonna start today. Look at the method of the integrating factor, maybe compare it again to the method of undetermined coefficients, and then we'll knock out any practice problems here. We have time to knock out. I don't wanna go past the break on these items here. So let's look again at the definition of linear equation. Linear equation says the slope function on the right, remember the right-hand side is literally, for a first order problem, the slope function. Because the first order problem says the first derivative equals this function. When we talk about second derivatives later, then we can't say it that way. So we'll have to think of something else. Get someone else in the room right here. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember, this is just linear equation. It's just a first order differential equation where the slope function has a special form. T's can be crazy and everywhere, but the Y appears only once to the first power as a factor. Now the book considers these so important, we consider them so important, the book actually wrote two sections to do this, showing you one method in section 1.9 and one method in section 1.8. Both of these methods are valuable and they both have their pluses and minuses, which I'll make a little chart of right here but you want to know both of them. I also have a handout where I physically compare both of them doing a problem. That would be a valuable handout. So, oh, and, and before I go on, uh, yeah, again, so I always remember things as I go. When I say I've posted solutions to the homework and I posted a Mathematica notebook that showed you how I created the graphics to the homework problem, you know, consider that. Let's look just for a second, just so there's no misunderstanding. I'll show you exactly where I posted those. Let's see, I'm on my web page. On my web page here, excuse me. I will uh, make the text size a little bit bigger. That's good. So now on the homework list, when you click on 1116, for example, you don't see just the problem, you see the problem and the solution. And I have this little lag problem I'm not going to deal with immediately. There, there's a solution coming up. It asks you, actually asks you if this data you were given represented exponential growth. And in and of itself, it could be exponential growth, but it's kind of, you know, like, points are jumbled around, how can you make a firm commitment that that's exponential growth? Well, you can use their hint that they gave you on part A, which said, oh, I could discover the growth rate by taking the logarithm of that data. Okay, so there's that's what I mean by I have posted a solution. Second, on some of the solutions, I say C, the technology that I posted, for example, in this problem 1.4 was problem about Excel. So I actually gave you 1.41 alt, I gave you a template for doing that problem, but here right below it, I gave you the filled in template after you know, you'd handed in the problems. So if you want to see exactly how I filled that in, if you were having issues, you can download that completed spreadsheet. Also, I said the problem one, two, and one, three were some difficult graphics for Mathematica because of the presence of the ET squared. 
So here is a Mathematica notebook where I did the graphics for the problem that I presented, for the solution that I presented, and you can download that and test it against you know, what you would want to create. You guys did create some interesting graphics and some of them are very good and some of them you're just trying to work around the problems that were popping up. But uh, in 1320, let me, or 1310 alt, excuse me, I want to see some of the graphics that showed you the slope field and the solutions at the same time. And you can look at the solution I posted. So I'll blow this up for you on the screen. These were the solutions I posted with the slope field. And you had this one solution that dipped way, way down. So I, you kind of have to present that separately or you could present it separately, but you have four solutions above that and they were kind of more in the same territory. So here you see how they fit the slope field. And then I presented some other graphics with a different kind of solution in Desmos and in Mathematica. Remember I've told you previously, I have seen people coax Desmos or maybe hammer Desmos into making a slope field, but I don't recommend it. I don't think it's worth your time, but you can look up what tools exist. And then another graphic for answering the final part of that question. Okay, so sometimes the reason I want to show this to you is sometimes you just want to move on. I handed in a homework, got four out of five, got three out of five. I'm moving on. Don't just move on. The solutions I post are not necessarily the best way to do the problem, but at least it's a way that you could do the problem and maybe you compare it to what you did. Maybe you did it faster, maybe you did it slower. Maybe you did it more efficiently, maybe you did it less, but if you have any questions, it doesn't hurt to look at how someone else would do the problem. Okay, bearing in mind, I've given you one example of the method of undetermined coefficients and no examples of the method of integrating factor. Before I do another example, let me make a little chart here for you. And just to avoid writing out long words, I'll abbreviate the method of the integrating factor and the method of undetermined coefficients. So pluses and minuses method of the integrating factor is extremely general on first order problems. That means it'll do more of these problems than the method of undetermined coefficients will. Now let's score a point for the method of undetermined coefficients. When you can use it, it is very fast. It is very quick and maybe a little bit less error prone than the method of the integrating factor. Here's another point in favor of the method of undetermined coefficients. As we extend our work into systems in chapter three, this can be extended, excuse me, in a useful fashion. to systems of equations, which we haven't talked about yet, that's chapter two. And the method of the integrating factor is usually about functions and not systems. Can't be extended as effectively. So let's just speak it in a positive way. Excels at first order linear equations mostly. Okay. 
So the method of undetermined coefficients, we can pick another problem in here to do one and practice it again. But first, let me show you the method of the integrating factor and show you what I mean by it does problems that the method of undetermined coefficients does not. Let's take a problem and why not pick one out of the book? And since we're talking about 1.9, why not knock out one of the problems in section 1.9 that I have here on the list. So let's check out problem number 11. First, I'm going to show you how to do this problem, and then I'll show you why it works. So your first reaction is gonna be, wow, that's fantastic the formula for the answer, but how do I know that works? And I compare it to your use of the quadratic formula, right? When you use the quadratic formula, you don't derive it from scratch. You don't have to rediscover the quadratic formula every time you use it, right? You just know that if you have a quadratic equation, there's this formula that tells you the answers every time, as long as you use it correctly. Now, the method of the integrating factor is the same way. If I write down a differential equation, there is a formula that gives me the answer every time. And then after you practice using it, then you can say to yourself, well, tell, why did that formula work? But first, you're just thankful you got a formula. So let me write the formula down for you. Then we'll practice it then I'll show you why it works. So if you have a linear equation like this, some function of t times y plus some function of t on the end, here's a formula for the answer. The answer is y of t equals one over mu of t is the integral of mu of t times b of t dt. That's it, that's the answer. We're done, we can go home. You know, it's Miller time. Uh, except you're, you're not completely satisfied because what's this mu? You know, what's mu? I don't know, what's mu with you? But this thing that I need, this tool that I need right here, what is it? So I have to tell you what mu is. This is a Greek letter mu, lowercase Greek letter mu. And mu, the factor that I have to insert in this formula is the exponential of the opposite of the integral of a of t with respect to t. This a of t is the a of t in the problem. Okay, that's it. If you execute this mu, plug in the mu, there's the B from the problem, you have the answer to the problem. No questions asked. Of course, you have to execute it correctly. It's a formula that's uh, no less famous than the quadratic formula among people who do differential equations. Now there is a price, you know, I have to execute both of these integrals. And you know, sometimes integrals come in flavors that you can't execute. So first of all, let's just do an ordinary one that I can. So the problem 1911 says dy dt is, oh, minus 2y over t, okay, is 2t squared. See, so you got to get used to the fact that people might present you the problem other than in the natural form. Then they give you the initial value y of minus two is four. I'm gonna to to go to another piece of paper to do this, but before I do it, I am going to, if I'm gonna use a formula, I am gonna write this the way the formula reads it. So that would be dy dt equals two over t times y 
I'm emphasizing the A of T right here. plus 2t squared. I'm emphasizing the b of t. So, you know, don't screw up with a minus sign. If you're gonna use this formula with the minus sign that I wrote there, make sure you write the problem the way the formula read the problem. And initial value four. Okay, let's move this to another piece of paper, knock it out. And then we'll show you why it works. So I can move on to another piece of paper. First of all, I just number these papers because remember I post all the papers from the class sessions as we go along. Uh, let's write two over T, Y plus two T squared. So if you want to be even more specific, I just write it on the side. A of t is 2 over t. B of t is 2t squared. Kind of like you write down a, b, and c for the quadratic formula sometimes. Well, at least when you were learning to execute it. Here's the initial condition. So step one is what's mu? So mu of t is the exponential of the opposite of the integral of a of t with respect to t. Let's fill in a of t, exponential of the opposite of the integral of two over t dt. Let's keep going. This is two times one over t. The integral one over t is log t. So this is exponential, of the opposite of two times log absolute value of t. Don't throw away the absolute values. The integral of one over t is the log of the absolute value of t, not just the log of t. Now, after telling you to be careful and not cut any corners, I'm not gonna write a c here. You say, if you're not gonna cut corners, you have gotta write a plus c. Well, I'll show you in a second when I show you why this works that I don't need the plus c there. I'm just gonna roll with this. Now, how do I clean this up even further? I mean, this is a little awkward here to insert into my formula, right? I want to simplify this for, I want to simplify this further. Remember, E and natural log are what? They are inverse functions to each other. This minus two is in my way. So first, remember another rule of logarithms and coefficient in front of a logarithm is the same as a power inside a logarithm. So now I can write e of the log base e of absolute value of t minus two power is just t to the minus two power. Now that is still a little bit ugly looking. So let's polish that. Well, first of all, I could say minus two power just means the reciprocal of the second power. That's one improvement. But here's something I should have done before I started the problem in a way. Because the absolute value of t depends on whether t is positive or negative. And when I square the absolute value, you know, it doesn't, it kind of negates the absolute value sign. But I want to do that and hide some truth for you. I don't want to do that and hide this truth. The truth is, the moment I see one over T, in fact, the moment I saw one over T in the problem, I had to do what? I had to exclude the possibility that T was zero. Because if T is zero, I don't even have a problem, let alone a solution. And that's the error I made in 1515. You got to go read that. So I have to choose right now to do this problem for the t's that are less than zero or to do this problem for the t's that are greater than zero. Which should I choose? The initial value tells you which to choose. 
initial value says, you're doing this problem with data at t equals minus two. t equals minus two, you better have y equals four. So you can't do the problem over here. You have to do the problem for the negative t's. In that case, the absolute value of t, if you're talking about negative numbers, is minus t. And that's how it should be treated. But I get a little break because minus t squared and t squared is the same thing regardless of what t is. It's just t squared. Okay, so I very carefully worked out what mu is. Mu is one over t squared. Now I'm gonna carefully insert that into the formula for y. y of t equals one over mu of t, the integral, mu of t, d of t, dt. Now there's a trap left here. I mean, this was working very, very carefully and legally. There's still a little legal trap left here. So don't break your concentration. I'm not talking about one over mu. Now mu is one over t squared. So one over mu is just t squared. I mean, don't make that mistake. So make sure you treat the one over mu properly. And then inside here, I have to write mu, which is t squared. Now I have to insert the b of t. b of t is two t squared. And here comes the trap. Your first reaction is, oh, that's excellent. This integral doesn't look threatening at all. Got the t squared, t squared cancel out. Well, it's true, they do cancel out. This integral is not gonna be threatening at all, but you still have to execute it legally. Sometimes this integral could be a mess, but here it's problem 11, you got a break. So now what I mean by here's the trap. T squared out front, what is the integral of two with respect to T? I'll even put that in my notes. Well, your first reaction is, it's 2t. So the answer is t squared times 2t. Sorry, I'm gonna move my paper up. But then I hear someone shouting at their muted microphone. No, 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 you forgot about the plus c. Okay, you're right, plus c. Now here I added the c. That's funny, a second ago, up here, I said, I'll ignore the C. So that's gonna have to come in my explanation, right? I can't just choose to ignore things or not ignore things. So I gotta have the plus C right here. But this is the trap. The plus C, the two T plus C is this integral. And it's not T squared times two T plus C left over. It's t squared times 2t plus c. That c belongs to the integral and everything that belongs to the integral is getting whacked with a t squared. Okay, so this was the trap. C belongs to the integral. The mu multiplies the C also. Don't forget that. Okay, now let's land this puppy. I'm feeling a little bit better now. The answer is 2t cubed plus ct squared. And now I can bring in my initial value. It says y is four when t is minus two. 
So I'll figure out what C is by putting minus two in here and here, putting the four in place of the Y. So two times minus eight, I'll do some simplifying as I write, plus C times four. And so what do we got here? 16 negative, toss it on the other side. So 16 positive plus four is 20 is equal to four C. So C is five. Sorry, I'm gonna tear off the paper. And keep it advancing. So now I've got my solution. There's one more trap left. And this is the way of all, well, just about all analytic solutions. See, if you're going to say to me, I'm going to give you a formula that answers that problem, Dave, then you've written a high bar. And you've got to be very, very exacting and lawyer-like in that formula you provide. So here's the C is 5, right? Let's put the 5 in there. Y of T is 2T cubed plus 5T squared. And you think you're done. But what did I not do? Without the domain, this answer is incomplete and wrong. And you say, no problem, 2T cubed plus 5T. The domain is all real numbers. Everybody knows that a polynomial is defined everywhere. Wrong. Why is the domain not all real numbers? Because at the very beginning, you had to exclude t equals zero. t equals zero isn't even part of this problem. There is no problem if t is zero. And then you had to make this choice. So legally, the answer you built is only good for t less than zero. This is the completed answer. This is the correct and completed answer. So this is the method of integrating factors. It's a little bit like using the quadratic formula. If you use the quadratic formula exactly correctly, you get exactly the right answer every time. The method of the integrating formula is a similar formula-based approach, but you have to use the formula exactly correctly with all the steps included. This is kind of funny to say that that's the answer, t less than zero. You know, if I asked you to draw this, could you draw this? Well, of course you could draw it, but I just want to point out to you how you draw such things in decimals, just in case you've never done something like that. So I'm going to pop over here, pull up a Desmos. And just graph. Oh, by the way, I didn't point that out fast enough when I did that. Do you see I'm logged into Desmos right here? You can create a count of Desmos for free. You don't have to do anything. I, I know it's annoying to create just surplus weird accounts. But the utility of that is if you have this thing you made saved, then what you could do is share the graph. So if you were working on something and it was not meeting your expectations, you said, oh, it's not working, this doesn't look right. What you could do is, you know, in your Desmos window that you got, just copy this page that you created and then send me a link. Say, Dave, could you look at this Desmos graph? I don't think it's what it's supposed to be, okay? So that's a handy reason you might wanna just make yourself an account Desmos, it's a free account. So anyway, here, y of t equals uh, three, I'm sorry, two t cubed plus five t squared. Yeah. There's my graph. But if I want to just show the parts where t is less than zero, what you do is put a braces, t less than zero braces. 
Now it only works out the part where t is less than zero. In fact, you could do it anywhere like that. I could do this from uh, minus two to zero for the same thing. Just put the restriction in the braces. So you can define piecewise functions in Desmos. You can put several pieces together in a different way, but I'm not gonna illustrate that now. Uh, what else do I wanna say about this graph? I might want to doctor x-axis. So I see a little more of it. Okay, now I see a little bit more of my graph. Uh, I wish I could check that it actually solved the problem. Now, another day I'll show you how to check you solve the problem in Desmos. But remember, you can check right here, right? Because you can always take the derivative of this thing that you created. And this thing is not even hard to take the derivative of. What you got here is 6t squared plus 10t. Is that the same as? 2 over t times y plus 2t squared. Well, what is y? This is the 2t cubed plus 5t squared. So what you get when you get this is you got 4t squared first time. Then you got 10t's. Then you got left over 2t squared. And so the answer is yes, it is the same. This problem works out. I don't think I've said that as many times as I wanted to by now either. Whenever you give an answer, this is not like selling stuff on the street corner. Whenever you give an answer, there's a way to check whether the answer is right or not. That's why this is math and not psychology. And, and I'm not knocking psychology, I'm just trying to be funny. You know, in psychology, why do the mother duck lead the baby ducks? Why does the baby ducks follow? Well, it's because the baby ducks had a complex and they don't like their father. And then 10 years later, it's no, it's because the mother duck imprinted on the baby ducks. And I have friends who are psychologists. So don't worry, I'm not slamming psychologists. But in math, the answer is either correct or it's not correct and you can know the difference. Everybody can agree. So do not neglect that when you give an answer, you can always physically check if it's correct or not. You don't have to hand in a homework or test and say, oh, I hope that problem's correct. No, you check it. Okay, I'm just preaching a little bit there, sorry. Okay, so now we have a new method called the method of the integrating factor. It works every time. And it does problems that the method of undetermined coefficients does not do. In particular, the method of undetermined coefficients wouldn't work well on this because the function in front of the y is not constant. The method of undetermined coefficients is very quick, is very powerful when you're dealing with constant coefficients. When the a of t is a constant, Let me write that down. So if that a of t is constant, I pull out the method of undetermined coefficients. The method of integrating factor works even when the thing, the coefficient in front of the y is not a constant. Okay, good. So we did that and we knocked out a problem on our list. So at least we got one problem down. Now, Here's the part that's kind of interesting. And this is presented in the book. The, your next question is kind of naturally like, oh, but uh, how does this work? Or where did you get this formula? So I'm kind of torn between, should I show you legally why this is true? Or should we do another example? I think I'm going to choose do another example. Although in the book, he tells you why this legally works. And I have a feeling I'd like to do the same. Not because you're going to reproduce it, not because you're going to prove it yourself. 
That's not what this level of class is about. But it is kind of comforting to know why the quadratic formula works, right? Likewise, it'd be comforting to know why this works. Where'd that minus sign come from? Why did he ignore the C when he did that integral, but did not ignore the C when he did that integral? Those are kind of holes in your confidence in the explanation, right? Until you see where this came from. So maybe we'll go back and show you where this came from, but let's do another example first. Um, I'm gonna pull up one from my list. So wherever possible today, this is what we're gonna do on Thursdays, wherever possible, we'll pull up a problem from our list. And I'm looking at 24 and I'm looking at 10. I think I'm gonna try 10. 1, 8, 10. Let's write it up. Page one, page two. This is page three today. We'll also take our standard break at the top of the hour, but uh, maybe let's work out this problem first. This is an example. 1.8, number 10. And the problem goes like this. dy dt plus 3y equals the cosine of 2t and y of 0 is minus 1. So this is a linear problem. And remember our definition of linear problem has dy dt, the derivative equal to a of t y plus b of t. That's our definition of linear. But anything that can be put into that form is linear. So this is a linear, first order linear equation. I could just break the three y and put it over here on the right. There is a value to putting the 3y on the left, particularly since this is a constant. It's telling me, it's when I see this, and this did come from 1.8, which is another tip. But when I see this, the first thing I think is method of undetermined coefficients. I got this problem, let's call it double star. Because this is a constant in front of the y, I'm going to use the method of undetermined coefficients. By the way, I have three videos walking you through each major step of the method of undetermined coefficients and three videos walking you through each major step of the method of the integrate factor. So again, you'll be watching those videos. And again, they're two to three minutes long. So they're not meant to be a burden. I had an issue with a student I know at the University of Michigan during these pandemic times. And he came back to me, said, uh, how are you doing in your engineering course? Oh, it's okay, it's, it's a lot of fun. But the professor talks for an hour and a half in the recording, and then he posts two hour recordings afterwards with all the stuff that he didn't say during the lecture. So essentially the professor was pumping three times the material at them and making them required reading, required watching. I guess I'm making things for you required watching, but I'm not multiplying the lecture times two or three times, okay? Those videos that I post are two to three minutes long. So you make time for those. Okay, what was the technique of the method of undetermined coefficients? The idea was to take the non-homogeneous problem, that's when all the y's add up to something other than zero, to look at the homogeneous problem and to build the answer in two steps. First, write down an answer for star. First, the general solution to star. And the general solution to star is very 
simple and quick. Why? Because it's constant coefficient. This is the mother of all differential equations. This is the MVP of ODEs. General solution to this is P to the minus three T. Now general solution, I don't have an initial condition for this problem. I have to admit that there's a constant, an initial value. That's where the constant comes out in the MVP of ODEs. I never want you to take this problem and do the separation of variables, logarithms, blah, 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 dance around and reproduce this. I have no problem if you just quote this from memory. Okay, this is called the homogeneous solution, the YH, because it's the solution to the homogeneous problem. It's the general solution to the homogeneous problem. And here in mathematics, homogeneous means just sums to zero. Okay, second, we need to find one, only one, not general. We just need to find one solution to double star any one will do. Uh, still, that can seem kind of uh, daunting because, you know, where am I going to get this cosine? But remember what we ran through last time, and this is the core of the method of undetermined coefficients. Think of the left-hand side as giving birth to the right-hand side, as creating the right-hand side. So if I put things in here, for y, they better burst out with a cosine. So I'm not going to say that y is a parabola. No, if I differentiate a parabola and then add three copies of the parabola, I will never get the cosine function. I'm not going to say that y is an exponential function. No, if I differentiate an exponential function and add three copies of an exponential function, it will never magically turn into the cosine function. In fact, you know from your general differentiating in calc one and calc two, that the cosine function and the sine function kind of dip back and forth as their own derivatives. So the author playfully calls this guessing, but it's not really guessing. It's more like making a logical choice. If I want to give birth to the cosine function, I'm going to have to feed the left-hand side cosine functions. And by the way, I'm not going to feed it the cosine of 7t. Remember our example last time? Because when I differentiate the cosine of 7t, I just produce sine 7t, three times cosine 7t, and that'll have nothing to do with cosine 2t. It's not that I'm going to feed the left-hand side a cosine function. I'm going to feed the left-hand side a specific cosine function. Okay, step two, when I feed the left-hand side a cosine function, the derivative will produce sine functions. Three times cosine is a cosine function. So I anticipate seeing sine functions come out over here, but I cannot tolerate that because there are no sine functions here. I have to let them cancel out somehow. So I think what I need to do is feed that problem a sine and cosine function combination so that they can add out, cancel out something and get this lone cosine. Last logical decision. I do not know how many of these I need. I do not know how many of either one. So that's why it's called the method of undetermined coefficients. I'll just put two undetermined coefficients in front Put this into the problem and then see what happens. So here we go. What's dy p dt? Now watch also how I organize this in columns. The derivative of 
a cos 2t is minus 2a sine 2t. But I'm going to put that over here on the right because I'm kind of thinking about the right hand side as the sine column. Sorry, move up the paper. What's the derivative of b sine 2t? It's 2b cos 2t. This is going to naturally go in the first column. So that's dp dt. That's the first piece. Second piece is three yps. So let me add right below it three yps. I'm doing this in a kind of a, like a table. Now remember, you already learned how valuable tables are for Euler's method. So there's a reason I'm doing this in a table. But this problem is kind of so mellow, I wouldn't need to. But let's focus on this table presentation I'm doing. Because later I'll do problems that get very messy. The table is going to save our rear. So we talk about 3 times yp. Here's yp. 3 times this is going to be 3a cosine 2t. And 3 times that will be 3b sine 2t. Now I'm supposed to add them together. And when I add them together, according to the problem, I'm supposed to get cosine 2t. So the paper is slipping off the top of the board. Bring someone else in here. This paper is slipping off the top of the board. But when I take the derivative plus three times the original, I'm supposed to get cos 2t. Let's see what I do get. On this side, I got sines and cosines. Now, let me organize them by sines and cosines. For example, the cosine, I have three a's and two b's. I like to put things in alphabetic order when I do. How about for the sine 2t? What do I got there? Minus two a's plus three b's. So it's just a matter of organization. And that's why I'm demonstrating this in a table. And I'm moving my paper up, sorry. So I add these together. I'm supposed to get cosine 2t according to the problem. I add my derivatives together in the order in a nice organized column. And here's my cosines, here's my sines. Now, you're first of all, you're a little nervous because you got sines here, but no sines here. Because say, no, 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 I have sines over here. I just have zero of them. How many cosines do I have on the left side? One of them. Now you can anticipate what I'm going to say. If these two things are truly equal, then 3a plus 2b had better be 1. And minus 2a plus 3b It better be zero. So this is back in the old days right now, like your two equations, two unknowns. Uh, these are two lines. Where do the two lines cross? I mean, I do not mind how you do this. There's so many ways you've been taught to do this over the years. I'm not going to teach you to do this unless, you know, on the side you want to be remembered. I say you do whatever voodoo you do. And let's get the answer to this right here. Me, I would multiply the first equation by two and the second equation by three. That would add these two equations, kill the a's. Then I'd have four b's and what? Nine b's, 13 b's. Two times one is two. So I'd have b is two over 13. And then I put that back in there. This is four over 13, 13 over 13, shift to the other side, nine over 13 divided by three, three over 13. Now, I am not interested in you doing anything quickly. I'm only interested in you doing things correctly. So sometimes I do things quickly and I screw up, of course. So let's make sure 3 times 3 thirteenths plus 2 times 2 thirteenths is 9 plus 4 is 13 thirteenths. Yes. Uh, then put it in the second equation. Yes. So this is A and B. I don't care whether you do it in your head, your toes, your calculator. Don't do it wrong, or you can't plead like 
accident. Okay, anyway, now I have my YP. Of course, I do it wrong all day long. That's why I checked the answer, right? That's why I'm glad I'm not a architect. Because I have a discipline. We're doing something that can always be checked. I don't draw up the building and then later someone tells me, oh, that's beautiful, but you can't build it because it violates all these engineering principles. Okay, we are rolling. We got our YP. Remember we have our YH up here. So now we're finishing this problem, our example problem. So we put them together. I'll keep the example problem in front of us while we take this to the next page. So now my solution to this problem is the YH of T plus the YP of T. And then we'll take a break. And the YH, remember was C e to the minus three t, that was the mother of all differential equations right here, the MVP of ODEs. And then the YP, which we just worked out, I got the cheat and peak, 3 thirteenths cosine, 2t plus 2 thirteenths sine, 2t. And actually this is gonna make a beautiful graphic, but first let's do the C, then we'll take a break. So the C was Y of zero equals minus one. So I want to find out what C is, then I'll put minus one in place of the Y, put zero in place of all the T's, which gives me C times one, plus three thirteenths times one, plus two thirteenths times zero. So there's my C, sine of zero is zero. So what do we got? C plus 3 thirteenths, shove it to the other side. C is minus 16 thirteenths. And here is my one and only one unique answer. The graphic of this is kind of pretty. So when we come back, let's pop it into a Desmos and look at the graphic. The constants are ugly, right? Like, if you didn't do these yourself, you wouldn't believe they're correct. You wouldn't even guess them. But remember, you can always check them. I'm not going to differentiate and check this, but we could. What do I want to say about this before we take a break? So this is the one and only one answer because this problem satisfies the existence and uniqueness theorem. So I don't have to worry about not having another answer. I do, you know, I have to worry about making arithmetic mistakes, right? Maybe it's not 3 thirteenths. So I do want to check this, but once I check it and it works, well, then I know I have the right answer. Checking the initial condition is always required too, by the way. So when you put in zero for T, you get minus 16 thirteenths plus 3 thirteenths, but that's the way you built it, minus one. Oh, by the way, this is what I wanted to say. This is the method of undetermined coefficients. If you tried to do this problem with the method of integrate factor, it would certainly work, but it would have been very messy. So you got your two methods. Remember what we said at the beginning. They both excel in different things. The method of integrating factor always works but the method of undetermined coefficients is quicker when it applies often, most often. So if you want to have some fun, go do this problem with the method of integrating factor, but you won't enjoy it as much. Okay, so I will come back with a graphic, but now let's just relax for a second. It's 104, 105. We're doing good. We have knocked out two problems on our list and we've, not PM. Oh yeah, it is PM, isn't it? Okay, stretch your legs, come back in five minutes and we'll have some more fun. I'm gonna mute my microphone while I take a break.
Welcome back and unmute the microphone. Okay, so just a quick recap. And remember, you're welcome to shoot questions to me privately. Chat, you can direct message someone in the chat or you can do the just to everyone chat. We don't record the chat. Uh, the question off the public chat was, do you want to pause the recording? I usually don't. And, and the reason why is because then I forget to turn it back on again. That's the first thing I do wrong. But I figure I just post these two hours. You guys can scrub when you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube later, you can scrub past those five minutes. Okay. Where were we? We were at the quadratic formula of differential equations. So now we have two weapons, method of integrating factor and the method of undetermined coefficients. I told you yesterday that in the end, you would prefer one to another. That's kind of hard. You, know, you could prefer the one you like. It turns out for some of the future weapons that we're gonna develop, the method of the undetermined coefficients is more flexible. And some of our future techniques, our future weapons, our future tools in our bat utility belt are gonna look more like the method of undetermined coefficients than the method of the integrating factor. Although in some ways you could say this makes an appearance later too. But it is a formula. It is literally like the quadratic formula for solving linear equations. That means you execute it and you get the right answer. There's a price, executing those two integrals can be messy. It could even be physically impossible, but then you could use numerical execution of these integrals if absolutely necessary. That's not something I'm gonna get into in this class. So in the book, he gives you a set of examples where it says like, oh, notice these problems would be really hard to do, but write them down as if you had the integral answer anyway in section 1.9. Okay, I also promised you I'd show you why this is true. I think we might get to that, maybe, maybe, but let's call that dessert today. I wanna do another problem. So uh, for a couple people who joined recently, this is our Thursday. Our Thursday is just dedicated to doing problems, answering questions, and I was about an hour short of where I should have been during the first three weeks. So that's why we presented this method by doing these problems. So for, again, for anyone else who just joined recently, on Thursdays, I just make my own personal list. These are the problems I thought were cool. If you bring problems, you can throw them in the chat window. No problem at all. I'll use your problems before I use mine. But remember, if I think they're cool and I'm writing the test, then they're cool problems, right? Okay, very good. And again, this note that remember, many of these have solutions already posted. Okay, we will get rolling. So a couple of problems I received this morning and into last night too, said, what about this 1.7? What about this bifurcation stuff? So let's do a bifurcation problem, just a classical bifurcation problem to help you get rolling on the homework you're submitting tonight. So we've given you a sample of one nine, we've given you a sample of one eight. Let's do a sample of one seven, help you knock out maybe that problem from one seven. Um, I was looking at these three, I thought were cute before I came in today. Let's look at seven. Let's look at 19. Let's look at 21. Let's do seven. I mean, let's just seven, I'll call it a medium problem and not the easiest, not the hardest. Let's, it's a, it's a mellow to medium problem. So let's get this stuff out of the way. I'll keep numbering my papers. Thank you. 
Let's look at the next example. No way we're gonna do all the problems on that list above today, but you can pick out your favorites. So uh, they had an inquiry about bifurcation problems this morning. That's why this one occurred to me. And I'm gonna give you the same answer that I gave that person directly by email. If you don't like being all uppity and using Greek letters, you could just write an A there. Sometimes what people do is, you know, they're writing parameters in a different character, like a Greek letter or some other kind of letter. And the reason why they're doing it is to, you know, kind of set that apart. Like that's not the core part of the problem, that's an extra. And that's why people do things like that often. So I just want to say this and let's see if I can bring this into the recording in a non-threatening way. I think I don't share emails directly, but I will share this email without referring to these things. So how am I gonna do that? And then this little thing will make it into the recording, which is better than me trying to write it out for 90 seconds. Okay. How do you approach a bifurcation problem? Excuse me, got to get rid of that. Okay. This is how you approach a bifurcation problem. Let me screen share. Maybe that wasn't worth the effort. I want you to think about the core concept in a bifurcation problem. First of all, every autonomous first order equation creates its own phase line. Remember what is autonomous? Slope does not depend on time. So the kind of the time axis can be crushed into a phase line. Second concept, if every autonomous first order differential equation creates a phase line, then if you have a family of autonomous equations, like I just wrote on the paper, that alpha represents any different alpha I choose. That means I've written down innumerably many differential equations, a whole family. It's a common phrase in mathematics to refer to a group as a family. Then a family of autonomous differential equations does what? Creates a family of phase lines, a whole bundle of phase lines, a whole package of phase lines, a whole box of phase lines. Well, then what is a bifurcation diagram? And what is bifurcation? A bifurcation diagram is an illustration of what this family of phase lines looks like and how they are related to each other. So it's something like a family portrait, right? You know, these are all the people in the family. There's Uncle Dave, there's, you know, Aunt Jane. So this little tidbit at least makes it into the recording if I didn't write it on the notes. So I go back to the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a family of autonomous first order differential equations. I won't write that down because that takes time to write that down. But for every different alpha, I get a different phase line. Now, what is your problem? You can acknowledge that, you acknowledge that, but the problem is I don't have time to do 10 billion phase lines because there's literally billions and billions of phase lines. What am I interested in? I'm interested in the interesting or unique phase lines. So I'll show you a trick. And he does this in the book, but see the idea is much easier on a machine. You know, he says, draw phase lines for different values of the parameter, right? But 
drawing takes time. It's rewarding, but it takes time. So for every different alpha, I have a different slope function. Well, this just smacks of Desmos. This just screams animate. So let's take this to a Desmos and look at all of these. Of course, there are billions of them, but maybe I'll see the special unique ones. OK, so I will hop back and forth between Desmos and the, uh, let's say, f of y. Now, here's a little bit unfortunate thing. Desmos does not treat other letters nicely. So Desmos almost think, always thinks that when you say y, you mean the vertical axis. And it's almost impossible to tell Desmos not to think that. So notice what happens when I put in an a y squared. Desmos says, hey, would you like to animate this? Would you like to add a slider? I say, okay, we're on the same page. But then Desmos makes it sideways. Like I was talking about the y axis. Now I can possibly defeat that by using the capital Y, like, like sneakily telling Desmos, Oh, that's not a Y. So let's see what happens. I don't know if that works. A, Y to the two. There we go. We did fool Desmos into drawing it vertically. Now I've got some A's going on here. Let's just drag this thing back and forth, see what happens. Oh, OK, that's interesting. So for. For a long, long time, or for many A's, I got this kind of, it's not a parabola. I don't think it's a parabola, it's a fourth power, but I got this kind of parabola-like thing, this bowl. But then there is some point where the bowl gets bent up in the middle and bent down on the sides. That is a different situation. That is a different slope field. Positive slopes, negative slopes, negative slopes, positive slopes. Remember? This is the slope function. F of y is the slope function. So three places where the slope is 0. So what I got to do is translate this into a uh, what? Into a phase line. Now, before I leave here, why don't I just make myself some more space? Does anything else happen while I'm flopping around here? I don't think so. Let me, let me widen this up a bit. Let's go minus 5 to 5. Remember I said this was a medium problem, a mellow problem, not a crazy problem. Let's go minus 30, 230. You know, you can adjust. But it looks like I either get a W or a U, right? And that makes sense when you think about what the A is doing. The A is like turning on a parabola. And the A is multiplying that parabola, amplifying it. So the bigger A gets, the more power that parabola gets added. Of course, Y to the fourth is pretty powerful itself. But if A is zero, the parabola is turned off. And I just have a traditional Y to the fourth. And if A is negative, then the parabola is actually upside down. And you say, wow, the parabola defeats the y to the fourth. Well, it does near zero because any number to the fourth power near zero is very small compared to any number to the second power near zero. So now I'm thinking I just get more parabola power as I go down. And uh, I bet I could go down more. I would just have a taller w. This is the moment where we win, right? What did Charlie Sheen say? Winning. I don't want you to emulate Charlie Sheen. <laughs> but now I know I've won because I know what happens to this family. They're either U's or they're W's. And I know the moment when it switches from U to W. And that's when A is zero. So what do I got? I got the whole family in my mind. We'll make a drawing. I know the moment the family switches, and I know what happens on both sides of that switching point. 
that switching point is the key point. It's called the bifurcation point. So now I'm going to translate this into a drawing on my paper. And I'll bring back Desmos if we need to. But I'm going to remember positive A is U, negative A is W. OK. And A equals 0 in the middle. So when A is 0, I'll stay on this Desmos for a second. I have an equilibrium value at 0, 0. That means y equals 0 is a solution to this problem on the paper. Well, y equals 0 is always a solution. But that is the only equilibrium solution right there. If you like, you can factor, too. You can use lots of algebra tricks, right? y squared minus alpha. Let me go back to my paper now. If I factor this y squared, I'll get y squared minus alpha. Then that tells me I have equilibrium solution y equals 0 and two equilibrium solutions here if alpha is a positive number. So let's look at alpha. Oh, see, I said a, See, because Desmos made me say a. So here, let's talk about alpha being positive. How many equilibrium solutions do I have? y equals 0, again, is always an equilibrium solution. Sometimes the drawings get too cluttered, so I don't want to write y equals zero here. I just am going from negative to positive up. Here, if alpha is a positive number, I get two more zeros to this polynomial, two more equilibrium solutions. They are at positive root alpha above zero and negative root alpha below zero. I can label these if I want to. I'm not going to label them right now. I could make a note for myself down here. Three equilibrium solutions, zero, root alpha, minus root alpha, if you want to remind yourself. OK, now let's talk about, uh, what am I talking about? Negative alphas? Oh, OK, see, that's, this is a problem. You've got to always watch your positive negatives, so I apologize. When I factored this, that was a plus sign right there. So positive alphas, I got no equilibriums except zero. I made the same mistake yesterday when I was just quickly shooting out one of these. And then I didn't redraw this thing nicely. So here, what I have is alpha negative. Well, you're going to say, well, you got that backwards. Yeah, so I do. But first, let's draw the thing, and then we'll get it forwards. How about if alpha is a positive value? If alpha is negative value, then I have two extra equilibrium solutions. And I probably have to use absolute value signs, right? But if alpha is a positive number, then 0, again, is the only equilibrium solution. If alpha is positive, this has no zeros. Put that there. Now let's remind us just what our thing looks like. Graph looks like this for positive alphas. Looks like a U. So that means positive before the equilibrium, positive after the equilibrium. Growth, growth. Even when alpha was 0 and I got that very flatness of the y to the fourth, it's still positive, equilibrium solution positive, growth, growth. But here the picture was, for alpha's negative, the picture was the w, which gave me equilibrium, 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 w. Crossing outside, kissing the origin at the middle. So now let's be very careful about the positive negatives. From left to right, from bottom to top, it was positive values, negative values, negative values, positive values. This is really a bifurcation diagram, but it lacks one thing to make it complete. So I won't even call it complete yet and the fact that it's backwards, but I'll finish that in a second. So what did I say in my little tip a little while ago? Bifurcation diagram is displaying the whole family. 
And you say, no, no, there's billions of other ones you didn't do. Yeah, but I, I know all of them come in these flavors. The U flavor when alpha is greater than zero, the very wide U flavor when alpha is equal to zero, and then the W flavor when alpha is negative. But now I want you to pay attention to these arrows. I've shown you the family portrait, but I haven't told you how they're connected. I haven't told you how they're related. Now I have to tell you how they're related. So let's pretend I was moving from left to right. Don't tell me that that's positive and I can't do that. Then I'll rearrange it and move it from right to left. But as I move from left to right, I'm just sailing along with one equilibrium solution. No matter how many phase lines I draw, I only have one equilibrium solution. And that equilibrium solution is y equals zero. It's like they're connected. But the moment I cross that threshold of alpha equals zero, I have three equilibrium solutions. Even if they're really, really, really close together, I have three. With this pattern from left to right, up, down, down, up. So what happens is, yes, this equilibrium at zero is still present. Notice that this is a node. Remember when they both go in, it's called a sink. When they both go out, it's called a source. This is a node. This is a node. This is still a node, but they're both going down. But what happened is immediately after I did that, I kind of, I kind of like split. That's why it's called a bifurcation. I split. And I don't mind whether you do this with a triangle or anything else, but I split. I don't have to do it with a parabola. I split the node into a source, a sink, and a node. I flipped the node and kind of like split off into three particles, like a particle accelerator picture. Now, the reason why I connect these in the family portrait is to tell you what. What would happen if I drew another phase line here? You know, closer to zero. Maybe this was alpha equals negative four. But do you see you've already drawn the arrows? Because this line, this sideways parabola, what does it do? It resolves the bifurcation diagram into regions. Do you see above the line? and above the parabola, I have a uniform upness region, no matter how many phase lines I draw. Below the line and below the parabola, I have a uniform upness region. You can call it growth, I suppose. But when the particle splits off, when the bifurcation happens, what I do is I create two more regions, one of them, on the top is a downness region. And the other one below that line is also a downness region. Notice it is not one downness region. It is one, not one decay region. It is decay, stop, decay, stop. Equilibrium, decay, equilibrium, decay. So this is the family portrait for this family. This is the bifurcation diagram. It is a family portrait of the autonomous family. You always then single out that special relative in your family portrait who's either exceptionally good or exceptionally bad, you know, like the serious Black or the Albert Einstein of the family portrait. That value where things changed and you say, oh, Alpha equals zero is a bifurcation value. It's a moment when things changed. You can have more than one bifurcation value in a diagram. You know, you could have several. But when you have the bifurcation diagram, you're looking for that special moment when things changed. 
Now this idea of graphing this in Desmos is not a bad idea. You can graph it in your mind too. But you know, if you wanna see things wiggling around, you can type that into Desmos. But this is, this is not a, okay, I'll call this a easy to medium bifurcation problem. Factoring told you what was happening. I do have to admit, I drew it backwards. I would never detract points if you drew it backwards. I would just think you're left-handed or something. All the left-handers in the audience are saying, I don't know, it means you're right-handed. But if you want to see it drawn from left to right, no problem. I mean, that's not an issue. Time either goes forwards or backwards. Uh, you want to see it drawn a little bit nicer in that way. And again, this shape that I'm drawing is not meant to be suggestive of our parabola. It's just meant to be suggestive of two points coming together. So really what was happening is a source. Uh, do do this. I will not forgive this. You move left to right and bottom to top. So this is negative wise. This is positive wise. You cannot draw them upside down. I don't like that. Okay, node, sink, low. So the source, the node, and the sink were coming together to make a node. I did not, notice by the way, you say, oh, you don't need this line because it looks like that line. No, it doesn't. This line is not at a bifurcation point. You say, do you need to add these other lines in here? No, they were just for illustration purposes. There's nothing wrong with adding a couple extra lines as long as you label them correctly. This would be legally enough. And if they asked for the bifurcation values, make sure you say what the bifurcation values are. Here, there's only one. Okay, sorry, move the paper up. Okay, let me see if I've got all my papers going on here. For some reason, I had two papers labeled paper three. Paper five. Okay, now we're not doing too bad today, and maybe we got time for another problem. Um, and I'm also welcome, I'm also happy to answer any questions from the audience, or maybe by now you've looked at these and you see a favorite, or you have another. No problem. Uh, I wanted to do these first. I wrote this in reverse order because you're currently working on the homework 171819. So we could pick another one out here. Let me see if I'm excited about any of these. We could show you actually why that formula works. No harm in that. The book explains it well too, but sometimes it works better to hear people say it. I'm looking at 1644, I'm looking at 1642. 1642 is like a pre-bifurcation problem. They were trying to prep you for 17. So that's not exactly a new thing. 17. A little bit like your 17 problem. Am I reading that correctly? 17 refers to five. Why don't we do 17? Because it's a little bit like your one seven homework problem, unless anyone else has a suggestion. So let's look at one six, 17. And I'm gonna read the book but I'm not going to show you the problem. I'll just read the problem to you right on the paper. It, in the book, it says, go do problem five with these conditions. So I got to go look at problem five in there. So problem five says, dw dt is one minus w sine w. Got it. And problem five says, sketch phase line. 
That's problem five. Now this is one autonomous equation. It's not a family, it's only one. So it only has one phase line. So you think, well, that's pretty mellow. That's pretty small. I don't, you know, why should I do this? But then in 17, it says, and graph the solutions that would satisfy these conditions. So, yeah, let me get the paper moved up, sorry. So this is what makes it a little bit worthwhile. W of zero is minus three halves. W of zero is one. W of zero is two. W of zero is three. The reason I like this problem is because it's a reminder of what a phase line really is, really does. So we can sketch the phase line, no problem. But remember the phase line is a collapsed version of the slope field. So let me do this. Let me draw a phase line right over here. By the way, when you uh, do phase lines, do not put little arrow hats at the top or bottom to mean keep going because the arrows in a phase line have a meaning, right? When you draw a graph, right, don't you commonly say, oh, there's the x-axis, there's the y-axis. You know, you put little arrow heads on them, right? Do not do that on a phase line because the arrows in a phase line have a special meaning, right? So don't do that. So what are we looking for? We're looking for equilibrium solutions, right? Those are the most important solutions because they form the borders of other solutions. In other words, where is dw dt equal to zero? Well, that's where this is equal to zero. And I see some freebies, like if w is one, the right side is zero. The W is in one is equilibrium solution. The derivative of one is zero. The evaluation on the right-hand side is zero. So certainly W equals one. But then I remember sine. Oh, lots of zeros. When is sine W zero? When W is zero, when W is two pi, when W is pi. Let's do this in an organized fashion. How does the sine go? Like that forever? Zero, pi two pi. So this equation has infinitely many equilibrium solutions. Let's mark them zero. Let's call that two pi. Let's call that minus two pi. If you like, I will label them just so I don't get lost. Let's label that one as zero. Let's label that one as two pi. Let's label that one as minus two pi. Remember, always bottom to top, negative to positive. But then there's a one equilibrium solution, which is between zero to two pi. It's about a sixth of the way, more or less, right? So I got to sneak in a one right there. I don't think I did that proportionally, but we'll just take it. Now, remember these go on and on. And I will not draw them all. Of course I will not. Now, what do I have to do right now? I should be a little bit careful. It shouldn't be too complacent. I got to fill in the arrows. And you say, well, the arrows are going to be easy. Just up, down, up, down, up, down. Ah, but that one interferes a little bit, does it? So let's look at our sine graph. Between zero and pi, this is positive. Oh, shoot. See, I even goofed it up because I'm not paying attention. Zero pi, two pi. So I need more equilibrium points or I just need to relabel these. That's why you don't draw in pen. Sorry about that. Let me just up for you a little bit so I can keep the sign graph on there. Okay, so these are nodes. 
They're probably naturally sloppy. Right, now zero to pi gonna be positive growth, but then this factor interferes. So between zero and one, this is positive and this is positive. That is positive. I can just barely fit a positive arrow in there. However, after one, between one and pi, this will still be positive from this picture. This will be negative. So actually that flips. And then we can just keep going. From pi to two pi, this is naturally negative, but a number between pi and two pi will make this negative also. So one minus w looks like that, negative after w equals zero. Excuse me, after w equals one. It's hard always to get everything on one piece of paper. So you slide the paper up and down. Okay, so anyway, what I got is negative times negative is positive, and it's gonna alternate negative, and it's going to, what about between zero and minus pi? This puppy is gonna be negative, but if you put a negative W in here, you just get positive, positive, negative makes negative. So next one, negative, positive, negative. So it looks like I do achieve alternation. Now, I was nervous about that but you have to check it. Maybe it didn't alternate everywhere. So what I have is sink, source, sink, and right away, another source, sink, source. So it looks like I'm alternating sink source all day. I don't see any node unless I made an error. You can alert me if you think something is wrong. But this is why I'm doing the problem now. I want you to remember that the phase line is a collapsed, I gotta get my hands on the camera, a collapsed slope field. So when they say draw the solutions, they mean expand that phase line to add in all the t's. Now, I'm not gonna draw a slope field, although Mathematica or any kind of nice program would draw a slope field for me. What I'm gonna do is use the same scale. Here's pi equilibrium solution. Here's two pi equilibrium solution. Here's three pi equilibrium solution. In fact, here's one, it's a little bit tight, equilibrium solution. And then quickly fill in the other equilibrium solutions. But this is not necessarily all they wanted. They wanted these special four. So let's tick off these four. What if I started at minus three halves, which would be pi is 3.4, right? 1.5 is nearly there. That's minus three halves. This is the t-axis. I can put an arrowhead on that because forward time. This is forward y. Arrowheads here, I don't mind. You don't need them. But what's going to happen in that band? That band is a band of downness. So I'm going to be coming in like, like that and leveling off. A logistic curve with a band of downness. And you could write a slope field to confirm that if you like. What about w of zero starting at one? If you're starting at one, well, that's a freebie. Start at one, you always stay at one. One is an equilibrium solution. What about two? Two is in here, and that's a band of downness. You're saying, how do you know these level off into logistic curves? And you know, that's a fair question. It could, it could they act some other way? They could act some other way. They could hook into these lines, right? They could like 
and you're going to see this on a homework problem in some cases, hook into that line, like then die right on that equilibrium line. Well, the problem is that's saying slopes go in infinite. And these slope formula, sine always between minus one and one. And the W here is always going to be a finite number. So these sine values are going to always be dragging solutions to zero slope as time goes on. That's why I know that I draw these S curves. I'm doing decay with zero slope on both ends. Okay, did it, when it, another one to do. Oh, they want one at three. Wow, I really overdid this extra stuff, didn't I? So one at three looks like what? Looks like an exact copy of the previous one. Because, right? Horizontal translations of solutions are solutions for an autonomous problem. So I did this a little too tight. I don't like this. There's a picture expanding this. I was about to say our picture doing it with mathematic. I could do this with mathematic of multiple things here. I'm trying to think if there's a very, very convenient way for me to do this in mathematics. Yes, I think we have to do that because I think we have to demonstrate. So for the last thing today, let's yank up a Mathematica notebook and show you how to make this picture nicely more scaled in Mathematica. So I am grabbing launch Mathematica, and then I'll share a screen with you. I will do it from scratch. You can use one of my pre-built notebooks, but let's practice doing one from scratch. Let's use all the capabilities that Mathematica gives me. Let me pump up the size of the type. Okay, so you're looking at the notebook that I'm sharing with you. It's absolutely blank. So the first thing to do is type in a function that defines the slope field. W underscore colon equals, I'll explain the notation, one minus W stop sine W stop. Okay, so there's a lot in this notation right here. <coughs> From left to right, f is the name I gave the function. You can name anything you like. All functions in Mathematica are always delimited by square brackets. There's no round brackets. Round bracket in Mathematica means that's a term I'm multiplying. When I define the function, I list the variables I'm going to use with an underscore. And what that says to Mathematica, there's a name for that, and I have it on one of my spreadsheets or Mathematica notebooks posted, but it's reserving the w. It's telling Mathematica, W is going to be replaced by something, numbers. W is our variable. So 1 minus W times sine W. Again, notice built-in functions sine to Mathematica. All built-in functions in Mathematica are capitalized by default. If you write lowercase sign, do you notice that the Mathematica makes that blue? Blue means, I haven't seen that before. I don't know what that is. So capital sine W. So now I've defined the function. The colon equals is called uh, set delayed, or just basically saying I'm defining a variable like I was in a computer program. The next time someone says f of w to me, I'll replace it with this. OK, so now let's do vector plot. And I always do my square brackets, so I've delimited f of w, not round brackets, square brackets. And uh, that's just the Y or the vertical thing. I need to make a little arrow out of it by saying one comma F of W. Now I'm going to run. Now this is a slope field of T's and W's, even though the T's aren't doing anything. So I have to give some T scale. T from uh, minus two to eight. W scale, I was not very proud of my too large W scale. So let's do minus two pi for W. W comma 
minus two pi, in Mathematica pi is capital P-I, two pi. Let's see if we connect it on this. I got to end that brace. Notice before I end the brace, Mathematica has pink square brackets. So Mathematica is saying with those pink square brackets, you're not done yet. This pink curly bracket, you're not done yet. Make sure you see that. Right? So I got to put in that other curly bracket. Now everything's colored black. Mathematics is not throwing any warnings at me. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, that's a reasonable thought of what I thought this looks like. Let's do the same command. Look how efficient this is. But let's make it a stream plot. Where is that? Oh, it's right down here. Now, this is sometimes bothersome, like you got to slide down. Now, this looks a little chaotic, but it is looking like what we thought it would look like. Here's the one right there. So what I'm going to do is two things to doctor it up. So this is valuable technique. What I told Mathematica to do was do two plot functions. Of course, Mathematica stacks them on top of each other. Maybe I'd like to see them side by side. No problem. Just put them in a list. Remember, Mathematica thinks things in curly braces are lists. So if I say curly brace, give me a plot, comma, give me another plot, comma, curly brace, the indentations are mine, then what Mathematica is going to do is give me these two plots side by side. So, oh, thank you, Dave. No, it did do it side by side, but they were too large to fit side by side. So they put them page over. So naturally, Mathematica did them side by side. Now let's do some decoration on the second one. Let's say stream points, not strem points. See, Mathematica says strem is blue. It doesn't know what strem is. But as soon as I say stream, Mathematica says, oh, are you talking about stream points? Yeah. So let's say, notice 10 stream points. Let's just see what that would do. I'm going to open my window a bit so that Mathematica picks 10 random places. Let me pick the other stream points, course stream points. Mathematica, just give me a good selection. How about fine stream points? Well, Mathematica overdoes it, although it's pretty. How about the stream points I want? And I always forget how many braces I need when I do this. I think I'm going to do zero comma, and I know I'm walking up against the time limit. Sorry about that. But that's worth it, isn't it? If it wasn't worth it, you wouldn't be here anyway. But look at that. Zero. That was exactly what I drew on my paper, kind of. Now scale, I probably got lucky on, but now I'm feeling so good. I'm going to repeat these. Now, oh, sorry, pressed the wrong button. So let's pop in these others. And this is like, this is why you do, this is why you want to learn. You need to learn how to play with this Mathematica. Someone was asking me a good place to get Mathematica information. And you know, you can go to different places. Here's the other three. It's not quite what you wanted, but uh, regardless. So a uh, person said, oh, I found some information on Mathematica Stack Exchange. Mathematica Stack Exchange is like a Google for Mathematica, people answering other people's questions. Okay, so this is the correct thing, kind of. Notice Mathematica doesn't overlap the streamlines. So yeah, this one streamline goes all the way across. If I did not have that in there and that in there, it would go all the way across. No, it won't. Of course, because the computer doesn't want to make me famous. It doesn't want to help me. Yeah, so there are some bugs in this flow idea. 
you know, the best way to do stream points usually is to say automatic. Because then Mathematica just gives you a nice selection. I don't think course is wrong either. Because that gives you an unhurried selection. These are all S curves, but Mathematica is just telling you the flow. Okay. Let's get out of there. Sorry to go over time. Uh, thank you for being patient. I'm going to stop the recording. You can hang out and ask a question if you like. But then I'm just going to get this stuff posted and up, and you get going on the homework, and you've got one.